Hello and welcome. I'm Amritan Shura and you're watching Law of the Land on Raj Sabha TV. Today we bring to you the Prevention of Torture Bill 2010, which seeks to make torture by government officials an offence. To discuss the issue, I have with me Mr. Shankar Sen, former Director General NHRC, Nas uh, National Human Rights Commission, and Suhas Chakma, Director, Asian Centre for Human Rights. Now for the headlines. The bill seeks to make torture by government officials a punishable offence. The bill makes prior sanction from higher ups mandatory before prosecution. And the Parliamentary Select Committee recommends several changes and suggests inclusion of torture of women and children. The Prevention of Torture Bill 2010 seeks to make torture a punishable offence and attempts to make government officials accountable for committing torture. But the bill makes approval from government mandatory before initiating prosecution. As of now, torture does not have a dedicated legal framework under which action can be taken. In order to create a standalone torture prevention bill and comply with the United Nations Convention Against Torture, government seeks to bring about the prevention of torture bill. If India ratifies the convention and does not express any reservation to any particular provisions, then it will still be applicable to India. So in that sense, there is enough guarantees. It may not necessarily be reflected in the domestic law, but if India does accept uh, the convention without expressing any reservations, so the entire convention uh, will be applicable to India. The bill defines torture as any government official or an individual supported by a government officer extracts information or confession in such a way that causes grievous hurt to a person, endangers his life, limb or health mentally or physically. The bill also lays down the punishment for committing torture under certain conditions. Torture will be punishable only when it is committed for gaining confession or other information for detecting an offence, and if it is committed on grounds such as religion, race, language, caste. In such cases, the maximum punishment for committing the offence will extend up to 10 years and will also be liable to fine. The bill also seeks to lay down conditions for the court to admit complaints. The complaint will not be accepted if it is filed six months after the torture is committed and the sanction will have to be taken from the officer who has the authority to remove the accused. The police force is, uh, is, is neither trained in scientific investigations or scientific use of uh, uh, sort of uh, new equipments etc. which can actually give you evidence and which is incontrovertible. And second is that their mindset remains the same that the person is going to uh, sort of turn hostile, nothing is going to come out of it. India signed the United Nations Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman and Degrading Treatment or Punishment in 1997. The bill is an attempt to ratify the convention and make torture a punishable offence. The bill limits the definition of torture only to physical harm, but fails to include other kinds of torture techniques like electric shock, denial of sleep, which might not cause any permanent damage but causes intense pain and suffering to the victim. With camera person Siddharth Subina Roy, Rajya Sabha TV. The definition of torture is not consistent with the definition of torture in the United Nations Convention and requires the intention of the accused to be proved. It does not include mental pain or suffering. My question to you, uh, sir, is there are already a whole lot of provisions in the IPC relating to this. Then why go in for a separate bill? You know, India has not yet <coughs> ratified the Convention Against Torture. From the Human Rights Commission, we urge very much, and at our urging later on, India signed the convention, but it has not yet ratified it. For ratifying the convention against torture, there should be some domestic legislation defining torture, providing punishment, ensuring compensation. That kind of was not there. IPC Though, doesn't have that. IPC has certain provisions for 
offenses bordering on torture for which punishment is provided. But this is a standalone legislation which clearly defines torture, which IPC does not. And also makes clear that compensation for the torture victims, many other provisions are there. Mm -hmm. So some kind of domestic legislation prohibiting torture and also indicating the various forms of torture, action that should be taken was necessary. And that's why this kind of legislation was done. To ratify, it clearly says, even the select committee has found this out, that the UN convention as it was declared doesn't reflect in what India seeks to do. Is that correct? Well, I think it's correct to a large extent even today. And one of the elements of torture is uh, very clearly mentioned in the UN Convention Against Torture, the fact that its jurisdiction is not only national, it's also international. International in the sense, for example, Article 2 of the Convention Against Torture is clearly mentioned that if somebody is likely to face torture on deportation or refoulement to a third country, that person should not be subjected to torture. So, if that's the requirement, it's basically clear to the government of India that you know it has to go beyond national level because torture is one thing whose jurisdiction cannot be limited to uh, national level. So, in that sense, I think the committee is very correct to say that you know it still does not reflect the spirit of the UN Convention Against Torture. I'll, I'll, uh, Mr. Sen, I wanted to ask you on the sanction. Why do you require? sanction, prior sanction, to actually prosecute a government officer for an allegation as big as torture? See, this is an issue where I sometimes very often differ with the human rights activists and all. Mm -hmm. Section 197 Criminal Procedure Code provides that sanction of the government servants while di discharging his duties for any offence is called for. Simply it is necessary, otherwise it is impossible for honest officials to do their duties. Mm -hmm. Lots of false allegations, false cases would be brought against him. And you know, I can speak from my own experience. As a police senior officer, I said that unless the sanction against prosecutions were not there, false cases, I would have been dragged from, I, there are cases, dragged from court to court. So, mm -hmm. sanction is absolutely necessary, otherwise officials cannot discharge their duties. But good thing about the, what the, now the select committee has done, it has made clear that government has to, authorities concerned have to give its writing, the reasons for giving the sanction or not. not. And then, if it is not done within three months, it will be deemed to be. It will be deemed to have been do, do you, do you uh, Mr. Chakma, I know you are, uh, do you agree with uh, this argument? Do we really need to protect the civil servants or the uh, officers from discharging their duties? And will it really create problems if this protection is taken away from them? I think first of all, section 197 was amended in 1997 to provide immunity to the police officials who are engaged in the counter insurgency operations in Punjab. Uh, so that's, we know about the history of Punjab. But on the other hand, uh, whether a particular case is uh, false, vexatious, it's for the judiciary to decide. Mm -hmm. And the problem which we have at the moment with the entire prior sanction regime is that there is no need for this particular decision to be given, to be subject to judicial review. Mm -hmm. So in a number of cases from all over the country where you have uh, the request for prior sanction, the government official is not supposed to give the reason. Mm -hmm. And that reason, if it is made subject to judicial review, it's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Because there is a need for some protection for the government officials mm -hmm. that it was done in good faith. Then that good faith must be reflected in the order of the government itself. Mm -hmm. If that is not reflected, then government just says, we cannot give the permission without any reason. You will create a situation where executive, in a way, under secretary officer, will be actually prevailing over the judiciary. Yeah, but sir, I'll just one point, do you think police officials actually use this sanction to abuse victims or possible victims of torture? If an official wants to extract concession, 
is this really a protection for him sanction see question is like this sometimes there is gross abuse of authority by the police officers there is no doubt about it mm-hmm. when for which action should be taken against him but prosecution in the court of law which will drag on for years and years unless some sanction is there he will be absolutely flooded with false prosecutions it will be difficult and i agree with chakma when he says yes government must given writing as to reasons as to why sanction is not being given and that can be questioned in a court of law for example you need to see the select committee has provided very well it has mentioned against the order of sanction given by the government the officer also can go to the court of law mm-hmm. there is a fault this mm-hmm. sanction should not have been given that permission is given so let it be transparent that mm-hmm. let it not be sh- um, um, instrument for shielding officers but unless you give the protection in this de- after all just, you have to kindly remember that human rights is very good but human rights is possible when law and order prevails and mm-hmm. totally demoralized disheartened police officers will not further the cause of human rights on that note time for us to take a break when we come back we will talk about the recommendations of the parliamentary select committee welcome back the parliamentary select committee has recommended that the definition of torture needs to be expanded to make it consistent with the un convention the committee has suggested that torture of women and children should be included as an offence and definition of public servant should include government companies or institutions according to the national human rights commission report over 14000 persons died in custody in the last one decade nearly 13000 persons died in judicial custody and over 1500 persons died in police custody Let's look at some of the established forms of torture used by the government officials to attain objectives. Beating, head banging, punching, kicking, striking with rifle butt, forcible feeding with spoiled food, electric shock, cigarette burning by heated rods, submersion of head in water, rape, sodomy, the use of plastic bag placed over the head to cause distress and use of psychoactive drugs to change the perception. Illegal custody is generally the situation where the deaths take place because torture takes place there if somebody is in legal custody then all the formalities of legal custody have to be observed for instance the person is produced before a magistrate or judge for instance the person has to undergo the medical examination and the doctor will give report and saying what kind of injuries if any are caused to the person but then where the custody is illegal where there is no sanction judicial sanction for the custody or the person has not been formally arrested and the person is kept in custody informally in that kind of situation the torture is most prevalent beating is most prevalent the parliamentary select committee has recommended that definition of torture be expanded to include offenses under the indian penal code ipc the committee also wants torture of women and children to be included as an offense and definition of public servant should include government companies or institutions The committee has also suggested that minimum level of punishment should be 3 years with a minimum fine of 1 lakh rupees to ensure deterrence. It has also recommended that the timeline for trial should be fixed at 1 year and the time bar should be extended from 6 months to 2 years. It has also said that in case the sanction to prosecute is not given within 3 months it should be considered as being dropped. In India uh, unlike many other developed countries the statements recorded before the policeman are not taken as an evidence or not admissible as an evidence in the court of law which is not the case in let's say uk or in usa there are of course historical reasons for it and there are valid reasons also to to see that uh, all statements uh, given before the police may not be true because of the fear of torture or anything The bill seeks to exempt the law being implemented in exceptional circumstances like war, internal political instability or public emergency, but does not provide for an independent authority to investigate complaints of torture. The bill also does not provide for grant of compensation to torture victims. 
The Law Commission report on custodial crimes had recommended that if any police fails to register a case of custodial crime, the judicial authority should have the power to conduct a preliminary inquiry. But the prevention of torture bill fails to include any such provision in the bill. With camera person Siddharth Subina Roy, Rajya Sabha TV. The committee was of the opinion that the bill should include guidelines for arriving at a fair compensation to the victim or to his dependents on his death. Compensation. But before we go to the compensation aspect, I would like to ask you, Mr. Mr. Chakma, the point was made that since statement before the police is not admissible in court of law, if that is a protection for the victim or of uh, or the alleged person, then why give another protection in the level of sanction? No, I think, I mean, the issue is uh, the, because of the situation which we have in the past, where the police always was trained to extract confession. And but is that admissible? No, it is not admissible under then the Indian Then what's the evidence. point of getting extraction if it is not admissible in court of law? See, I mean, there are certain provisions which are admissible. I mean, people are still being tried under the TADA where a confession made to a police officer is admissible. But the, I would say, I mean, I think confession is a different issue and sanction is a different issue. Uh, and sanction is not what to say, be seen, in, in, in what to say, I mean, in, in, to be linked with the admission per se. Okay. I'll, I'll come to you on the same thing. When there is a protection available to the victim, or to the uh, person who is accused of certain thing, because the statement before the police is not admissible, then what more protection does he require? See, the position is like this. Legal position is this. Under Section 25 of the Evidence Act, confession before the police is not admissible. Mm -hmm. But there is another section, Section 27, that confession leading to the discovery of any fact. Mm -hmm. For example, he says that the knife was there, only that part of the evidence is admissible. Mm -hmm. So, that very often leads police also to indulge in third degree methods, ah, etc. Okay. So, what is not given in section 25, partially it is given in section 27. But the point is this, basic point is this, that sanction is a different thing altogether. Whether this man, he may not have been harassed or tortured by the police at all. This is to he prevent the police from being uh, troubled, dragged, 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 dragged into unnecessarily court. Unnecessarily in the court of law and prevent him from discharging his, his duties. duty. Okay, now the point on illegal custody. How relevant is it today? Is it still continuing? Or because that is what Mr. Kant said, that most of the torture activity actually happens in illegal custody. See, I mean, we have found that you know, in the NHRC reports, which they collect about 120 odd custodial deaths in police custody uh, per year. I mean, it usually takes place within the first 48 hours of the arrest. And most often, the custodial deaths in police custody, not the prison custody, in police custody, invariably has to do with the illegal detention. And okay. it is still rampant today. Because when somebody, as Mr. Khan had said, somebody is arrested legally, then you have to enter in the registry and you have to get the medical examination done. In that case, even if the person is suspected to have been tortured, uh, the policeman will make sure that he is not killed because they have to produce the person before mm. the court. It's only with the cases of ex, uh, illegal detention that you have the deaths in police custody. Illegal uh, uh, custody. The problem, I mean, the issue is that the policeman, he wants to discharge his duty. And it is the duty that has been given to him. That's his responsibility. Now, why does he resort to things like illegal custody to actually ensure that the real facts are brought before him, even if it is not admissible before court? No, it's a point. And this is a perpetual problem before the police. You know, under the constitution, under the law, if you detain, a, detect, arrest a person or detain a person, you have to produce him before the court within 24 hours. Right. And then take further remand for this. Yes. 
very often police feel that within 24 hours and all he will not be able to extract information mm. so he keeps him for two three days then shows the detention, detention. and then as he says that you have to enter, enter the diary and now under the direct of D.K. Basu's case after that, he has to be examined by a doctor. Mm -hmm. You can obviate all this thing. So this is something we have to strongly raise our voice and say these are the abuses which have to brought to an end. Let's say illegal detention doesn't happen or if they are, the police is prevented from doing it, do you think a policeman will, be, will not be able to discharge his duty if he doesn't illegally detain? And then after three days show uh, no. custody? No. Actually, that's a wrong idea. Mm -hmm. Policemen will be able to discharge their duties. Within 24 hours also he can question. He can tell the court that yes, the, we require him more detention for him in custody for a longer time. And by and large, detecting case or detecting a burglar and crime is important. But far more important is to protect the constitutional liberties and rights of the citizens. So that culture you have to develop within the And that is hugely lacking. Awareness oh, yes. of constitutional right of the other person. And uh, the need for it. And, and the need for it. And to understand that for doing our duties properly, we have to respect the rights of the citizens. Hmm. That is somewhat missing and that is what we are trying to inculcate in the force. It's time for us to head into a break. When we come back, we will show you an interview with retired IPS officer, Mr. Gautam Kaur. Welcome back. My colleague Subina Roy spoke to Mr. Gautam Call, retired of IPS officer, and tried to get his point of view. So you have been a former IPS officer and you have seen the ground level reality. So what according to you is custodial torture and do you think the bill fulfills all the sections of torture? In police parlance, uh, torture would be hurt against the body. That is, you are undertaking physical violence. But over the uh, years, when there has been a uh, large number of custodial deaths which rose out of um, uh, also physical uh, beating and torture, um, police in many uh, parts of the country have now dropped the, the concept of physical beating and they have shifted to mental torture. So, what are the existing laws in the Indian legal system to deter a public official from committing a torture? The various provisions of the Indian Penal Code, they have uh, sort of uh, put a control and even provided punishments and these uh, punishments are extended to all government servants. The only thing that has now been drawn out from the Penal Code, which was at one time an approved punishment was whipping. Uh, this was removed by an amendment in the British time itself in 1922. So, whipping is not permissible, but all other forms uh, were permissible until, uh, until the, uh, the penal code was last amended uh, and uh, the punishments are there. So, one has to look into those punishments. Sir, any suggestions to improve this bill? Uh, first of all, the best thing would be that we take in the provisions, the best sections or recommendations uh, which have been made by the select committee because they certainly uh, improve upon the original. One, the definition of torture is now clarified. Um, it is not simply causing uh, grievous hurt because that is limited to physical torture only. And I said just now that uh, mental torture uh, is the mention of mental torture is absent in the bill itself. Now, select committee has taken note of it. So, that will be accepting the recommendation of the select committee incorporating them first into the new draft act would be a wise thing. There is no independent authority to investigate complaints of torture. Well, that is a very important point. But before we go to that, sir, I would like to ask you quickly on the issue of monitoring and what the select committee has said in, uh, about times of war, what has to happen relating to torture. First is some kind of a monitoring mechanism is called for 
and the rules to be draft provided under the Act should also mention about the monitoring of it. Otherwise, there is no point. To, it will be difficult to prevent custodial torture. Then, in times of emergency, during war, or order of the superior, can be no justification for torture. Mm -hmm. Third, of course, which is equally important. And protection of victim. Yeah. Protection of the victims. Victims of torture, protection of the weaknesses, arrangements have to be made. Of course, this is not easier said than done. But some provision should be there for this. And there I disagree with a little with Mr. Gautam Call when he was saying mm -hmm. that particularly independent agency for investigating into the complaints is not feasible mm -hmm. in a sense that most of the complaints against the police are done by the CIT mm -hmm. and also by the CBI creating another agency and hoping that all cases will be done. May Multiplicity. Not be the, it may not be the answer. We have to strengthen our own mechanism and get mm -hmm. the work done. Mm -hmm. On the point of international ramification, the implications. No, I think the government of India is trying hard and it's some getting extradition of Kim Devi who was accused of dropping the arms in Purulia in 1995. It's simply because he raised an objection that he fears he will be subjected to torture. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the government of India is also seeking extradition of Tiger Menon from UK. What the government of India has to understand is the fact that the government of UK and government of Denmark also have the legal obligations under the Convention Against Torture and the decisions of the Supreme Courts in those particular countries could be even challenged before the European Court of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So if the government of India seriously wants mm. uh, to augment its fights against terrorism and also get these suspects to be brought to India, be tried here, then there is a need for the government of India to accept international obligations. Otherwise, what will have happen is basically the fact that they will not be able to get the extradition. So you got the extradition of Abu Salem, but you have reached a situation where you almost have to send him back to Portugal. Okay. That's not helping anybody. And that's why I think the government of India has to understand it as the... Uh, and does this bill do with this? Does this bill? I think once the government of India adopts this bill and ratify the Convention Against Torture, the government of India could say that yes, we have accepted the same legal obligations as the other countries. So there is no need to fear for extraditing anybody to our country. Okay. On that note, thank you, sir, for joining us on this discussion. It's time for us to end the show. You can email your suggestions and comments to law.rstv at gmail.com. You can also watch our shows on the YouTube. We'll be back with a new issue and a new episode. Keep watching Raj Sabha TV.